Hi there. Welcome to Leading Lights. I'm Greg Donaldson. The Bible says, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. I wonder if you've been laboring in vain in various areas of your life. Today we're going to be looking at Psalm 127 and we're going to see how we can build God's house in our families, but it also applies to churches, to businesses, to various different areas of your life. And if we follow these principles, we know that God is involved in building our house. And if God builds something, it will succeed. Stay with us. You'll be blessed today. God bless you. So families are important. They are wonderful. They are a source of blessing and joy. They are a source of life. None of you were born without having a mother and father. I hope that's not news to you. I hope that's not a shock to you. But the reality is every one of us was created in the context of a family. And families are of God and from God. God designed families right at the start. The Bible begins in the book of Genesis with God putting a man and a woman together and creating a family. And at the end of the Bible in Revelation 21, 22, there is a wedding celebration and the bride of Christ is united again with Christ. So families and marriages and all that kind of thing is so vital and central to Christianity and to our lives. Whether we admit it or not, the greatest source of our joy and some of our pain often comes out of our family relationships. Young men and women are looking for relationships. Children with their parents. Uh, parents struggling and agonizing over issues with their children. Sometimes it's in-laws. Sometimes it's extended families, aunts and uncles. And then there's step-parents and step-children and all these different variations of families that exist. And what we want to do today and over the next few weeks is look at families and understand God's word to us as families today. And you may say, I don't have a perfect family. This, this is going to be uncomfortable for me. I want to say that that's exactly the scenario that God speaks into is imperfect families. Did you know that in the Old Testament, Israel had 12 sons from four different women. Did you know that Jesus was born into a family where everyone considered him an illegitimate child? And so when God said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased at Jesus' baptism, it was an affirmation. And he had had his whole life being told, you're not a legitimate son. And God said, this is my son, I'm well pleased. And there's so many stories. Every single one of the, the Bible stories and Bible heroes had a broken family. Every one of them. It's quite extraordinary. Even the first couple, Adam and Eve, their son Cain killed their other son, Abel. And God speaks into families. And God uses broken and messed up families. And I'm so grateful because I come from one of those. And God can do great things. So Psalm 127 is what we're going to be looking at today. Just for a few moments. And it starts by saying, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. And the idea behind this verse is that if we don't get God involved, his power and his help, his energy, his blessing, if we don't get God involved, we're going to struggle to build our house. And we're going to see that it's talking mainly about families a little bit later on. But also, if we don't consult the instruction manual from the, the designer and creator of families, we're going to have a struggle. And unless the Lord builds the house, we labor in vain who built it. I am not... Uh, accusing broken families in any way. As I said, I am from one. However, I do recognize that the way families operate today in our modern world creates problems. In the 1960s, the Western world said, we're throwing out normal old traditional family values. Anyone can sleep with anyone. And the results we are reaping in the decades since then are broken homes, unhappy people, addictions, depressions, and a whole host of social problems. 
And while I am the product of one of those families, I recognize that unless we do things God's way, we produce results that are not good. The second part of that verse says, unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. And this talks about parents over a family being watchmen, guarding their children. And, and the idea is watchmen sat on the wall and watched out and protected the city. And he says, unless we are involving the Lord in watching over our families, we do it in vain. And I, I just want to start off by saying, if you do not have children, or you are not able to have children, or perhaps you're a person whose children have grown up and left home, this applies to you because whatever God says in this psalm about families very much applies in the family of God. And the family of God has a role, you have a role, and I have a role in coming around and helping people with their children. Plus, you can foster children, you can adopt children, and then thirdly, we in the body of Christ can have spiritual children. And this is so important. Jesus never got married. Jesus never had physical children, but he had spiritual children. And the, the spiritual aspect of being a parent is so, so important. And so what I'm saying today is, is valid for you, even if you don't have children or can't have children, because spiritually in the family of God, we can be watchmen. We can watch over children. We can bring people up in the faith. So he says, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. The next verse 2 says, it is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows. For so he gives his beloved sleep. And this speaks about the world's messed up idea that the best thing I can do for myself and my family is work myself to death. And I know there are some of us here who are staying up till 11, 12, 1 in the morning working, working through the weekends and you're battling and you're struggling. And I want to say to you, God's word says he gives his beloved sleep. When we put our families in God's hands and we say, Lord, I want to build my family according to your plans. He says, get a balance in your life. Amen. I heard a little poem, it said, He crossed and swam the widest sea for her. He climbed the highest mountain for her. He walked through the hottest desert and he swam across the widest river for her. And she left him because he was never at home. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, you and I can have a misguided idea of how to build our families. We can think that if I just work so hard, especially the dads here, but also the mums, if I just work myself to death, then I'll build my family and I'll provide for them and I'm being a good dad. And I want to say to you that God says there's a balance in this. He's not saying don't work. If you look at all the other verses in the Bible, he says work. Work hard. Work for the Lord. God gives you the ability to work and to make money. But he says there's a balance. God gives his beloved sleep. There's a restfulness. There's a, a rhythm of life, night and day, weekends and weeks. There's, there's the whole balance of life. And we say, God, I'm trusting you to give me rest in what I'm doing. And you may say, I'm not a physical parent. What about in my looking after other Christians and discipling people and looking after a small group or, or whatever it is? God says there's a balance. It's a rest. It's never supposed to be hard, hard, hard toil. It's supposed to be hard work, but a sense of rest in the middle of it. And then he goes on to say in verse 3, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Children are a heritage and a reward. A gift from God. And this is where I feel that we've lost the plot as a society. 
I just need to be honest with you and say that I feel as a Western society, we have started thinking of children as an optional extra, as an inconvenience, as an expense, as a bit of a pain in the neck. And so we have got to the point where most Western countries have a birth rate that is so low that we are shrinking as populations. And we need to import people from other countries to do the jobs. Young people, we need to import them because we're not having enough children. And most of the time, you ask a person why, and they say, I was worried I couldn't afford it. Can I ask you a question, folks? If children are a blessing and a reward and a gift from God, and He gives you that reward, if God gives you that gift of a child, the miraculous gift of putting DNA together and all those amazing things that happen, can He not also give you enough money to look after that child? He's great. I think we've, you know, there was a, a, a minister, a Christian minister called Mr. Malthus a couple of hundred years ago. He was the first to say, the earth's resources cannot sustain the population. We need to control, we need to have less, less children, less children. And the, again and again, people have bought into this idea and it's been proved wrong again and again and again. And interestingly enough, the countries with the biggest populations in the world are the new superpowers. I'm just throwing it out there. The countries with the biggest populations, the ones who didn't listen to Mr. Malthus, are the ones who are on the precipice of being the superpower, the economic superpowers of the next generation. And I believe, not that we go crazy, but that we treat children as a blessing. And we want them. You know, children can sense when they're wanted. Children can sense when they're welcomed. They've got an inbuilt sense that says, I belong and I'm wanted and I'm loved. And one of the main things we need to do if we're going to build our families and our churches according to God's plan and His blueprint is to say children are a blessing. I love children. You remember Jesus had children running up to Him and the disciples tried to keep them away. No, 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 stay away. And Jesus said, no, let the little children come to me. And they climbed all over Him. That's what we are supposed to be like. Children are a blessing from the Lord. And if your children sense that you love them, that you want to spend time with them, or if you're not a parent, but you're in an environment where there are kids and you welcome kids, I promise you, you will see the blessing of the Lord. He goes on to say, like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Now this is a strange one. He says, like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are your children. And so we've gone from using a metaphor of a city and we're building a building or a city. We've gone from building a house. We're no longer watchmen on a wall. Now we are warriors wanting to attack. We were protecting and watching the walls, but now we're wanting to attack. And he says, your children are arrows that you can use to fight an enemy. You're a warrior and you can use your arrows to fight an enemy. And he goes on to say, blessed is the man whose quiver is full of arrows. In other words, your, your little package that you hold all your arrows in, your cartridge with your ammunition. He says, if you've got lots of children, you've got lots of arrows, you can be a better warrior. What is this all about? I'm just going to briefly go through some points that this gives us for bringing up children. Number one, an arrow is something that you fashion. In those days, you don't go and you buy an arrow from the arrow shop. You get a stick and you find it and you make it straight and you take off all the little lumps and bumps and twigs and you get it nice and straight. And then you take it in your hand, you put a few little feathers on it to keep it straight, you sharpen the end, you put it in your bow, you hold it and you pull it back and you hold it close to your chest 
and you aim it in the right direction and when you've pulled it back as far as you can and you've aimed it as accurately as you can you let it go and it flies through the air to its target friends we need to start thinking of children as arrows in our hands but also arrows in God's hands to achieve his purposes and I know this is hard because we look at a little child a little baby or a three four year old six year old and we say how can this be an arrow in God's hand I want to protect my child I, I want to keep it safe from harm from harm how can this child be an arrow and I want to say to you that Hebrews 10 says to us if we shrink back and we reticent we go to destruction but if we have faith and we move forward we prosper and we succeed and that is what this idea is about is to say prepare your children to do ministry for God to have an, an outward looking vision to be able to do things for God right from early on have that in mind that one day when they reach 20 or whatever age it is I'm gonna let go one day I'm going to let go of this child and they are going to fly and they're going to do great things for God. They're going to go away from me. I know as parents we want to keep our kids close to us for the rest of our lives. But he says, no, they're an arrow. They're going to go to a different place from you. But in those 20 years when you're preparing them to be shot out, he says, make sure that they're straight. Make sure that you've helped them to iron out the kinks in their lives. Make sure that they're sharp, that you've, that you've honed them through discussion and, and you've trained them to be able to handle conflict with the world and with enemies. Make sure that you've pulled them back as close to your heart as you can, that they can actually hear your heartbeat, that they feel close to you in those 20 years of preparation. And then make sure that they are aimed in the right direction. The Bible says train up a child in the way that it should go and it won't depart from it. Make sure you've trained them in, at a certain point in your life. You're going to go out into the world. You're going to be an arrow for God. You're going to do great things. You're going to take his kingdom to other places. You're going to defeat the enemies of God. You are a weapon in God's hand. But for now, my child, you're very close to my heart and you're hearing my heartbeat and you're feeling my love for you you're in my hand he says like arrows in a warrior's hand you're right here in my hand i'm keeping you safe but with a view to shooting you out why am i saying all this because if we build the house according to god's plan we get a successful family if we take the world's ideas of family in where it's all selfish, it's all about me and my comfort, it's all about protect and, and block us off from the world and never mix with the world or whatever it is. If we take wrong concepts in, we will end up with a wrong result. But if we shoot these arrows out at the right time of their lives, when the Lord builds the house, it prospers. And then the last verse says, happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. I don't know how full a, a full quiver is. I know there's some people, I have a friend who lives in Australia who has 12 children. Some people say a quiver full is 12. I know others who have one child, they say my quiver's full. I can't handle any more. Only you can tell when your quiver is full. But I just want to say, please let's not let the world tell us when our quiver is full. Please let's not f let fear and doubt and selfishness tell us when our quiver is full. You know, there, there are some of us here who have finished having biological children, but we could foster or we could adopt. And we could give children a direction. We could make them arrows in the hands of God, even though they're not our own children. Is your quiver full? And then he says, they shall not be ashamed but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. Who shall not be ashamed? Well, we as parents shall not be ashamed, but also the children shall not be ashamed. And they shall speak with their enemies 
in the gate. That speaks about us having gates in our, in our lives and in our families. You know, there, there are enemies that come in to destroy our families. There is the world's pollution. There are evil people. There are evil spiritual forces that would try to come in and destroy our church family and our physical families. And we as parents speak with those enemies in the gate. You as a parent and I need to be going to the gate of our family and telling the devil to get his hands off my family and off other families. We as Christians have the privilege of being able to pray on behalf of our city and saying, devil, take your hands off our children. Spirit of suicide, stop affecting the teenagers. Spirit of drugs and alcohol and sexual immorality, get your hands off of our kids. We need to be speaking to enemies at the gates. Amen? We really do. We need to be speaking out to the enemies at the gates. But then the children also speak at the gates. They go to the gates of the enemy. Jesus said, the gates of hell will not prevail. I give you the keys of the kingdom and the gates of hell will not prevail against you. We need to teach our children to have an outward looking mentality that says, I'm going to take territory. Whatever my parents did for Christ, I'm going to do more. I'm going to be greater. I'm going to be stronger. If you are a Christian parent with children watching you, Set them a bar, an example of what you've done for the Lord. Let them see you praying, reading the word, giving your tithes and offerings, helping the needy. Let them see that, but then say to them, but you're going to do more. You're going to go and storm those other gates, and you're going to increase the kingdom of God by speaking to the enemies at the gates. And if you are not a parent of physical children, you have a great opportunity to pray on behalf of spiritual children in our church, but also families around us. We can build God's city just the way that he wants us to. I just want to close by talking about this, this idea of gates just for a little bit more. Jesus said in John chapter 10, I am the door or the gate for the sheep. I think it's verse 5 and in verse 1 he said anyone who comes in any other way other than through the gate or the door is a thief and a robber. Jesus had this idea of having his sheep, his flock in one place and he then lies over the door and protects it and anyone has to come through him to get to the sheep and anyone who tries to go around him is a thief or a robber and the idea is that he as the shepherd will protect his sheep. We need to have that mentality for our families that says I love you my children but I am the gate. If you want, let me, let me just say if, if a boy wants to date my little girl I want to look him square in the eye and I want to see what he's made of. I want to see if he flinches. Why? Because if he is too chicken to meet me, if he doesn't want to come through the gate, then he is, has no business with my family. He's a thief and a robber. And it's the same in Christian circles. We need mothers and fathers in the body of Christ who will say, I am a gate. And I will look at an, a, a person who's trying to harm my family or even an, an enemy spiritual force. And I'll look them in the eye and say, I am the gate. I'm protecting my family. And we do that through prayer. So I'm going to ask us to say, God, make our physical families strong. Make our children strong and healthy. May they be arrows that fly out for you. But also, Lord God, make our church a family for you, a, a house built by God. Let's have watchmen on the walls who pray. And as we do that, we're going to see the life come out. Because when children grow, then reproduction happens and there's life and there's excitement. And I believe we're coming into a season of reproduction in, in the Lord. So I'm going to ask us to spend a few moments in prayer. And I'm going to ask you to say, Lord, make me a watchman on the wall. Make me a gatekeeper. Make me a parent, spiritually and physically, who watches over, but also who releases and prepares and aims 
children and disciples people to grow in you. And as you do that, I believe God says, now you're building in my way, with my help, I'm going to breathe. I'm going to breathe, breathe my blessing. Just one more thing. You know, we speak often about claiming the promises of God. And many people come to me and say, Greg, please tell me some promises I can hold on to for my family, for my children, for my marriage, for my family relationships. Please give me some promises. I want to say to you, the psalm that we've just read is a promise that you can hold on to. You can claim and repeat these promises and say, God, I'm believing children are a heritage and a reward and a blessing from you. God, I'm believing for my house to be built by you and with you. I'm believing for arrows to go out of my household and my family and to change the world around me. Claim these promises and you will see families changed. Jesus said that two or three people gathered in his name can be a church. It does not have to be a large building with professional staff. Leading Lights Network exists to help you do extraordinary things for God. Gather a few people in your home and use the free Leading Lights resources to help you disciple and reach your friends for Jesus. We have sermons and teachings, practical advice and the stories project that will help you communicate the gospel in story form. We also have a prayer team and experienced church leaders who want to stand with you and develop your potential in Christ. We would love to partner with you to see God's kingdom come in your area of the world. Visit leadinglightsnetwork.com or download the Leading Lights app from any app store.